and we are live. All right. Well, my people from Mentor Point, let us welcome our Facebook, you know, what is that? YouTube brothers and sisters who are watching. So let's just give them, you know, a, go, a big God bless you and just wave at them and <laughs> let them be part of this. <laughs> Hallelujah. And of course, we, we prayed uh, and we know that God will bless everybody that will be watching here, either now or later. So what are we dealing with today, those that are writing? Go ahead and write. Understanding the Bible. Understanding the Bible. It's one thing to know it. It's another thing to understand it. Wisdom is a principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. But in all thy getting, get understanding. So today, that's what we'll be doing. Understanding the Bible. And if you'd like, unpacking the Bible. And the Bible is big, it's huge. Hence, you can't just unpack it without properly unpacking it. You then need to unpack it in the right way. So we are going to uh, be focusing today mainly on the on the OT, which is the Old Testament. So if you'd like, call it a Bible study. I'm still okay with that. But this now will set you up for something great. Your hunger for God's word will go to another level. Your appetite for God's word will be increased today. There is nothing frustrating like trying to read something that you know your spirit wants to read, but every time you read it, instead of you coming up with answers, you come, up with you come out with questions. It's frustrating. You go in there because you have questions. You want to come out with answers. But only to realize that you always come out. Jesus, you come out with questions. It's frustrating. So today, this will help you. Like most of you, you know, we only teach this in our school of ministry and, of course, in our mental point. And today, this class was mainly meant for the mental point. They are here watching over 110 students. It's full, hence we can't take you know, uh, more students. It was meant to be 100, but it went to 110. They are here, and you are on YouTube. So... It's a blessed day. It's a blessed day. Hallelujah. So get your notepad quickly. Let's do it. Uh, let's do our confession anyway. Because, <laughs> I mean, it's going to be too much. Quickly lift up your Bible. Quickly lift up. If you don't have your Bible, go ahead and lift up your hand and say after me. Say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. I believe, I believe. It, contains the word of God. it contains the word of God. I am what it says I am. I have, I have what it says I have, and I will do what it says I will do. Today I will be taught the word of God. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive, ready to receive the incorruptible word of God. And my life shall never, ever be the same again. Say glory, somebody. Glory. That's more like it. Well, are you guys ready? You, you on Zoom, I know. You see, that one today, I won't be like, are you here on Zoom? Because <laughs> I know you are definitely here, right? So I'll be asking YouTube, are you here, YouTube? So let us quickly go to the book of 2 Timothy. Michael Porsche, it's good to see you. The book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2. And of course, by the Spirit of God, I want us to read verses 15. This particular verse will sum, summarize, so to say, 
what we are going to do today. So if you know, or you know, if you do not know, as a matter of fact, what this service is all about, this verse we are about to read will give you an idea. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15, my Bible reads, King James 1611, let's go. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God. I'll, I'll read that again. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Until you divide it, you will not understand it. And in dividing it, you better rightly do it. Say amen, somebody. So today, in understanding your Bible, we'll be rightly dividing the word of truth. We are going to do some mathematics. Today, we are not focusing on multiplication but, or addition. We are focusing on division today. But we are dividing the word of truth. Say, I hear you, Apostle. So since I said we are going to focus on the Old Testament, please take off with me. So the teaching will be different, unlike, you know, when we, when we are having a service, it's a, it's a class, so it's going to be very much different. The Bible is God's truth about himself and how we should relate to him. That is the first thing that you should always remember. That is the first thing that you should always have in your spirit, that the Bible is God's truth about himself and how we should relate to him. And of course, it goes as far as showing us the nation of Israel, how God himself chose the nation of Israel and how they walked with God, how God himself promised to be with them and how God has been with them. But that's another topic for another day. Many fail to grasp the overall message because they have an insufficient understanding when it comes to the word and when it comes to what the Bible is. Uh, we, we will go deeper today. Like I always say to my mentees here that, uh, you know, this is not some dry theologically text, uh, textbook, you know, like a, th a theology textbook, so to say, that is dry. No, 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 no. It is the vibrant, story of God's redeeming work in the lives of his people. To summarize the Bible, and this is me, <laughs> the Bible shows us what went wrong and how it can be fixed. <laughs> the entire Bible shows us what went wrong and how it can be fixed. Because if nothing went wrong, then there was no need for us to have a Bible. So we have a Bible because something went wrong. And then the Bible comes to say this is how it can be fixed. Are you getting something? Now, whenever we are talking about the Bible, we are talking about the library of 66 books. So every time you think the Bible from a Latin word, Biblia, you must think a library. And this library has 66 books. But here's the interesting thing about this library is divided into two. There is, an, there is a part called Old Testament and there is one called New Testament. We are dividing it, right? Now, the Old Testament, which is our main focus today, has 39 books. How many books? 39 books. With at least 25 authors. Are you still with me? 39 books with how many offers? 25 offers. Because today we are focusing on the Old Testament. I might as well as go deeper into that. So, but just to balance the 66, when you go to the New Testament, we then have 27 books, right? With at least 9 to 13 offers, okay? If we were to, uh, you know, include 
those that were writing on behalf of others, it then goes to 15. But if you're going to bypass the ones who wrote and focus on the ones who were speaking, then you'll have nine authors. Example, the book of Romans, Paul is not the one who wrote it. He was the one talking. And somebody was writing. If you did not know that, you now know. One who say, but where is it in the Bible? Romans 16. Okay? Romans 16, and then just go down. I think before verse, um, I know my mentees, you know this, but, you know, there are people who, who, who need that kind of help. You know, they are still coming in the things of God and you just talk as if it's nothing. You're confusing them because all along they thought Paul was the one that wrote it, right? Paul is not the one who wrote Romans. Um, yeah, it's Tertius who wrote it. Verse 22, he says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you. Yeah, so verse 22 tells you who wrote the book of Romans, right? Uh, so, we have 39 and we have 27. So today we are focusing on the 39, which is the Old Testament. Are you guys excited about it? Are you guys here excited? Amen. Okay. So we, we are going to go deeper into explaining how the Old Testament is divided, how it was written. And if God allows, if time allows, we'll go to even uh, locations where some of these books were written. Because, I mean, you can't say I'm a Christian. And you, you just know John 3.16. It goes beyond that. It has to be part of you. You need to know more than just have... You see, a lot of people have sermons, but they don't know the word. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense. Some people don't know that the reason why Jesus had to go to Egypt was so that he, can, he could learn. It was more than just God protecting him from Herod. Jesus went to Egypt so that he could learn. Are you hearing me? Because if you are going to read the history of it all, Egypt is where everything takes off. If you do not know, and you did not know, writing started there. So that's why when he was 12, he confused the scholars. He asked questions that were difficult and answered questions, and they were wondering, what is this? That's why the Bible says he grew in wisdom. He was theoentropos. The word theo means God. The word entropos means man. So Jesus was God man. But he still grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with men, and in favor with God. So growing in wisdom means growing in knowledge. Growing in knowledge means growing in understanding. So let's go. We are going to go deeper. Are you guys ready here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want you to I think, let's do it this way. The Bible is divided into four. Then, the Old Testament. Where's, where's the bookkeeper? I didn't want to start here, but I mean, <laughs> I'll be forced to start here. Um, are you able to capture what I want to do? <laughs> I didn't want to start here, but I'll start here. Praise the Lord, everybody. So the Old Testament is divided into four. Of course, my mentees, please, some, most of you, you know this. So I don't think you guys should be writing this, right? We have Torah. And please, mentor, mentor point, we must tell our brothers and sisters on YouTube not to focus on what the apostle is writing, but to focus on what the apostle is saying, right? <laughs> because some of the things... You can see them. You guys already know that. So we've got Torah. What is Torah? Torah, well, 
Torah means instructions. You know, I've never really taught on Torah. Just hits my mind now that I've never really explained what Torah is. Torah means instructions or the law, if you want. It was like, um, how do you put it? Um, how do you put it? A life manual for the Jewish people that time. And the Torah, we are talking about the five books that Moses wrote. I'm not going to write all of them here. Otherwise, you'll be too lazy to read your Bible. So the five books that Moses wrote are called Torah. Pentateuch. They are called Pentateuch. Pentateuch. Pent, we know, is a Greek word. Uh, you know, that means five. Pentateuch means five books. So if you hear somebody say, uh, in the Pentateuch, so they're talking about the five books, which we call Torah, the law or instructions, right? So five books. The first five books of the Bible. What are those? Genesis. Did you just say Revelation? Did I hear somebody say Revelation? Like, really? So it's Genesis, Leviticus. Is it? No. Look at some people agreeing. Oh, Lord. So it's Genesis, Matthew, Acts. Is, 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 is that? No. It's Genesis, Exodus, which is the coming out, and the what? Leve. Ticker. Ah, you're quiet now. All of you. Oh, Lord. Yes, Leviticus. Then what? Alphabets. Numbers. Then, no, Deuteronomy is the last one. Then, Deuteronomy. Right? So those are the five books. It is important for you to know this. Seriously. Don't just think, ah, somewhere there's Exodus. No. It is important for you to know that. So we have here historical books, okay? Historical books, and of course, historical books are 12. And I believe they are written in your Bible. Uh, they start from the book of Joshua down to the book of Esther. So from the book of Joshua, just after Deuteronomy, you enter Joshua, from Joshua to Esther. All those books are called historical books. So every time you get into that, you are in history. So here, if you are looking for the history of Israel, in that sense, read these books. Right? And some, of course, they are not in the chronological order, but they will give you what you are looking for, especially now because we are going to teach you what to look for every time you read a book. It will you know, give you an idea. Now, we have what is known as, this is prophetic, God's people. You see, don't focus on what I'm writing, please. Focus on what I'm saying. So prophetic books, and how many prophetic books do we guys have? 17, right? Yeah, 17, you guys know that. 17, and they are all divided, right? You guys remember? Yeah. So we have five major prophets. And 12 minor prophets. Okay? So I'm not going to focus on that. But since we are dividing it, today we are just breaking it down. We are, we are breaking the Old Testament into pieces. So that you will understand. So we have 17 books here. In, that, in these 17 books, or within the 17 books, you've got major prophets. So major prophets. All right, major. Prophets, it's only five. Then minor prophets, it's only 12. Okay? So you guys remember that. So I'm writing that for you guys. So I'll remove it so that you guys don't get confused. But we are just passing by here. This is just us passing by. Then we have wisdom. But it's called what? Po poetic or poetry. Aha, poetic books or poetry. So poetic books. And how many are they? Five. So if you put all this together, you get what? 39 books. So now, what are the 17 prophetic books? They start from the book of Isaiah down to the last book, the book of Malachi. Some of you, you call it Malachi. So Malachi, you know, Malachi. Malachi is the last book there we know. And between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew, 
It's about 400 years to 450 years. God was silent. There was no prophet who was sent. And that's where most worldly leaders came about. But God was not bothered. People like Confucius and Alexander and all of that. But anyway, we're not here to talk about that. So here is from Isaiah to Malachi, right? Here we know that it's from Joshua down to Sister Esther. Hey, somebody say, it's not Queen, e Queen Esther, you know? But when, I'm, when, when I meet here, I will say, Sister Esther, how are you? <laughs> we'll talk nicely, right? So you guys understand. So here, of course, your five poetic books. I believe everybody knows that one, like wisdom, right? The book of Psalm, the book of Job. Okay, let me put them in order. From the book of Job to the book of Songs of Songs or Songs of Solomon. So it's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Songs of Solomon or Songs of Songs. So those are the five books. Are we clear here? So with this being said, I'm going deeper now. We have all of this has 25 authors. Say, I hear you, Apostle. I hear you, Apostle. Has how many authors? 25 authors. Right. So we go deeper now. Does this appear on your screen, guys? Yeah, well, it does appear on mine. Not that bad. Let me see if YouTube um, are here. Um, they say, can we move the camera towards the board uh, so that they see everything? Somebody's asking, is this life? Yes, very much life. <laughs> is this life very, very much life? Somebody, you see, I think sometimes it's important that when you study the Bible yourself, don't move just by what Google says. Okay, you're going to be confused. You see, one of the things that God delivered me from years ago was to look for answers on Google. Because there are people who think the Holy Spirit wrote Google. Or an angel landed and wrote on Google. It's men. And some of those men, they don't really care about your spirituality. They are just after what they are after. Right? So sometimes when you read something somewhere, don't take it as if it's from the Bible. Because one thing about the Bible it will never co uh, contradict itself. Okay? Now, I've taught you the seven principles or seven laws that governs the interpretation of the Bible. And we know that the first principle is that scripture interprets scripture. Right? So you cannot find a scripture fighting another scripture. Are we together? So when you find something in scripture, the first thing you check for is what do other scriptures say about this, not what does Google say about this. You see the mistake where people make? Because if you go on Google, you will find somebody saying there are three major prophets. That is them. But how do we, what is a major prophet, first of all, to study with? Of course, if you're going to talk, I understand that lamentation is there. You know, if we remove lamentation, then we've gone for, we have four. But if you put it and you look at it in a way uh, that Jeremiah had his hand on it, then you'll include it as a what? As a major book written by a major prophet. Of course, I understand that when Jeremiah wrote the book of Jeremiah, he was not alone. Baruch wrote with him. But that now makes it a major. So if you, if you don't study yourself, to understand those things, you just come up with a whole lot of things, okay? So the goal here is to help somebody understand the Bible. And I'm not, going, I'm not going to say to you, everything is going to be theologically correct. I'm not here to be theologically correct. I'm here to help somebody understand the Bible the way God wants them to understand the Bible. And as a student of the scripture as well, I'll try my best to make sure that, you know, uh, we teach the principles that we need to teach. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Now, so we move forward, okay? Because, I mean, when it comes to arguing, we'll never start, stop arguing. We'll never stop arguing. Up to today, there are those who say Paul wrote Hebrews. So, uh, this one say, you know, no. Sometimes we don't need to focus on, it's like coming here. And I say, example, the name God is mentioned five times in the Bible. Yet the name is mentioned six times, right? It's just, it's just an example. It could be I read and I saw it five times. You read, you saw it two, uh, how many times? Six times. But now, it does not mean I'm wrong. Because if you come to my translation, where yours it says God, when it was translated to mine, it says Lord. So we could be both right based on which translation we are reading from. Are we together? Because the Bible on its own, and here, uh, you know, of course you correct me if I'm wrong, but I know I'm, you know, in the mark. The Bible has been translated to at least 1,400 languages. And some words, when it was translated from, you know, uh, its original writing into our English or modern uh, language, right? Some words were duplicated. King James has at least 12,000, 12,000 something, 12,000 words, about 12,143 or 144 words. Some words were duplicated, of course, in terms of, you know, like when we say, you know. So you could have read yours, and the word prophet in the Old Testament maybe appears 410 times, example, then where it says prophet on mine, right? It then says a seer. Yet yours says a prophet. It's just an example. So I come and I say this. You come, you say this. So sometimes we need to look at, at we need to look at the motive. We need to look at the goal. Are we together? And sometimes before somebody fin before. Before you jump into conclusion so that you don't find yourself in confusion, you wait for somebody to finish. Then you say, wait, brother, then, 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 then we compare notes. Because the goal is for everybody to grow. Are you with me? I've done a lot of debates, but one thing I've picked up is that it doesn't really help anybody grow. It just, one way or the other, intensifies somebody's ego. So at the end, we should be able to Spirit of a prophet is subject to another. Are we still together? So, where were we? We are moving. 25 authors, right? About 25 authors. Of course, there are those who believe that it has 19 authors and those who believe these authors. Because <laughs> some, they believe this sounds like this one. Okay? Are you with me, guys? Are you still with me? Amen. Now, so, what I want you to understand and this is Apostle me trying to make you understand the Bible. So don't think, oh, maybe this is so. No, no. This is me breaking it down in a way that you are going to understand. Okay? What you need to understand is that the, hey, please, this is going to be deep, but not deep. The Old Testament, it is a shadow, or more like a shadow, right, of the New Testament. So the New Testament is the reality. So whatever you see in the Old Testament is a reality of what you're going to see in the New Testament. Does that make sense? He confuses them. He gives them different languages. The Tower of Babel because man was one. In the, Acts, in the book of Acts, man was one. One mind, one spirit, one accord came down, gave them different tongues, you know? In the days of Moses, whoever looked on the snake that was on the pole was killed. In the days of Jesus, Jesus was the one who was up there looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher. You see that this one is the shadow, this one is the reality. Are, are you with me? Now, this is what I'm going to say. In the first period, whenever you read the Bible, you need to focus on this. In the first period, God led Israel, because remember, it's the story of Israel comes in, like I said, right? Remember, the Bible is God's truth about himself and how we should relate to him. It tells us how people, principally the nation of Israel, came to experience God for themselves and respond to his word. 
So in the first period, the patriarchs led Israel. Remember what went wrong, then God now is Israel. Say, from there until now, it, you know, that's how we came about. Seed of Abraham. So the first period, in the book of Genesis, we see God leading Israel through the patriarchs. And who are those? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Then in the second period, Israel was led by prophets. Remember Joseph in Egypt? He was representing the Israelites, the Jews, right? The Hebrews, so to say. He died. Then they're in captivity. Because, I mean, they all moved there to start with because of him. But there was a prophecy that God gave to Abraham that his children's children's children will be in Egypt for 400 years. But we know that they were there for more than that, but we're not going to talk about that. Then later on, Joseph is no longer there. So Joseph is part of what? The patriarchs. And that is because he's the son of who? Israel. Okay? And he's the one that went to Egypt and people then ended up going there and they multiplied there. But when he died, they were all enslaved. So now from that time, God does not have a patriarch to use to lead his people. He then raises a prophet. So the first period, God used patriarchs to lead Israel. Then the second period, God uses what? A prophet. Right? Or prophets. Now prophets is from Moses to Samuel. Remember, in the days of Samuel, they rejected Samuel because they saw that the other nations had a what? A king. Come on now. And they went to Samuel and say, we also want what? A king. And he went back to God and God said, you know what? They did not reject you. They rejected me. So in the days of Samuel, Israel was under theocracy. As you know, theo means God. We are under democracy. So God was governing, leading a nation through a prophet in those days. So the period of Israel being led by prophets started with Moses or from Moses to Samuel. Then the third period, they were led by kings. So from prophets, Israel was led by kings. Somebody say kings. So kings, they start from Saul to Zedekiah. So the first king of Israel was Saul. Of course, we know that God rejected him and David came into place, but we're not talking about that. So please just pay attention to what matters. So it started from Saul and down to Zedekiah. And then from Zedekiah, the fourth period, right? Uh, the priests took the lead. So God was now leading Israel using what? The priests. Right? And the priests, they start from Joshua to um, Caiaphas. Are you with me? Caiaphas in the times of Christ, of course. And when we are talking about Joshua, it is important for me to say this, you know, because not everybody knows this. We are not talking about Joshua, the one who was second in command in the days of Moses. Not Joshua, the one who took God's people into the promised land. We're talking about Joshua, the priest, the one that you see in the book of Haggai, in the book of Ezra, in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah 7.7 7 talks about him. Uh, I think Ezra 3.8 3 talks, 3, talks about him. Haggai mentions him too. Praise the Lord, everybody, as the high priest. So that was the fourth period. But here's what I wanted you to, do, to know. From the patriarchs to the prophets, from the prophets to kings, from kings to priests, none of the leaders, right, was ideal. Because each individual brought in their own flaws to the task. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So the nation needed a leader who was a prophet, a priest, and a king. And they found him in Jesus. So each stage, therefore, was a shadow of the ideal leader who was to come. Hence, he's called the king of kings. Are you hearing me? He's called the high priest. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. 
Are you hearing me? And Jesus himself, remember in John 4, when the woman said, are you a prophet? I don't know if these people are understanding what I'm talking about. I thought this was going to be the easiest one for all of you guys. YouTube, you are too quiet. You are too quiet. You are in class, but you are too quiet. I believe we are in a dispensation. We are in a time. We are in a season, um, you know, uh, 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 where we should get into the word, get into the word. And of course, in the days of Samson, in the days of uh, yeah, Samson, we are judges. Are you hearing me? Is everybody here? But that did not last for long. So I hear you, Apostle. I hear you, Apostle. Hence, I skipped that one. So here is not me trying to, you know, like I said, be in order. I will teach you the major important things, right? That I think they are important. Okay? And this does not mean... Uh, you should not study for yourself and say, okay, this is it. No, no. This actually has to prompt you to study. Are we, are we together? Yeah. I think we once, when we did our Bible study a long time ago, I went deeper into it, but I then realized, nah, it's not necessary. <laughs> so YouTube, are you guys here? So there are certain things that really, whether somebody knows them or they don't know them, it doesn't change anything. Okay, so we move forward, right? Amen. So, let's get to the amazing or amazing Bible facts and statistics. Because this has to lead us somewhere. So, if you are thinking this is it, I don't know. This here is a start of it. I don't even think it's like a drop in the ocean. This is like a foundation. So many things will come on top of this. So if you are more fascinated about this, listen, there are bigger things that are going to fascinate you, not this. We are just passing by here. Right? So, like we said, number of books, the whole Bible, 66, right? But here's what now I like. The whole Bible on its own has 100 no, 1,189 chapters. Not bad, right? So chapters, I wish I could write that, but we, nah, it will take me forever. If I start writing, let me call the numbers. So chapters, you have 1,189. Okay? This is King James 1611 approved. <laughs> of course, you then have verses. And the reason being, it's because each book has a chapter. And a chapter has verses. So we are breaking it down that way. Just in case, how does this help? Because, I mean, without a verse, you won't have a chapter. Without a chapter, you won't have a book. Without a book, you won't have a Bible. So we have 31,101 verses. And words... Words, if you were to count them one by one, not, you know, leaving those that were duplicated, okay? Maybe when Lord appears three times, you just count it as one. So if you were to leave those that, uh, to include even those that were duplicated, and you see Lord five times, you count and say one, two, three, four, five. Words in the entire uh, King James 1611, there are 783,137. Number of promises given, 1,000. You want me to repeat the, the words? Okay. So the words are 783,137. Number of promises given in the Bible, you have about 1,260 to 1,340. Here, it depends as well from the, depends on the, translation. 
And we are not going to talk about predictions. It doesn't really help or fulfilled prophecy, number of prophecies, unfulfilled prophecies, number of questions. We're not going to talk about those, okay? But it is also important for you to know um, that in the Bible, the word Lord appears more than the word God. So you have more of Lord. I don't know if that makes sense. Like we said that, you know, in Old Testament, you're looking at about at least 25 authors. Uh, put that together. Uh, the new and the old, you have 34 going down to going up to 40 authors, right? Written over 40 generations, the whole Bible. Written in three languages or in three different languages. It was written in Hebrew, the Bible, Greek, and Aramaic. As we all know that the Lord Jesus did not speak English, the Lord Jesus spoke Aramaic. That's why... Uh, the literal translation and the Aramaic helps a lot of people. And if you can get yourself contemporary as well, especially if you are still coming in the things of God, it will give you that you know, illumination that you need. So Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, written on three continents, the whole Bible, as we know, and that is Europe, Asia, and Africa. The entire Bible. Written in different locations. It is important for you to know that because we are rightly dividing it, right? Amen. So it's written in different locations, wilderness, dungeons, palace, prison, in exile, at home, like the book of Daniel. You know, remember the children of Israel, the 12 tribes, after the Solomon thing, there was civil war just after Solomon, and they separated the children of Israel, the 12 tribes. Ten tribes went this side and say, we are Israel, and the other two said, okay, us will be Judah. One, others went to the north, others went that side. And they ended up in exile. Others ended up in Babylon. And there you see the likes of Daniel, and Daniel is in there, also writes a book. Wallace is in there. You know what I mean? Come on now. Amen. So, written in different places. And some were in prison. Paul himself, you know, some of the letters he wrote, he was in prison. Others were in wilderness. Written by men, you know, from all occupations. We talk about kings, prophets, priests, judges, peasants, doctors, fishermen, tax collectors, scholars, etc. Writing the Bible. All of them. One said, Doctor. <laughs> yes, Dr. Luke. <laughs> Glory be to God. And of course, we cannot talk about the Bible being written by different people, you know, from different professions or uh, all occupations or different occupations and not talk about the times. So it was written in different times. It was written in war, you know, the war, time of war, peace, poverty, prosperity, freedom, slavery. So there were those who were in captivity, and the Bible was being written. Part of the, some, some books were written that time. When there was war, some books were written. You know, when there was peace, some books were written. When there was prosperity, some books were written. When there was poverty, some books were written. So we'll go deeper into explaining this book, you know, as written in this period and all of that, so you guys understand. And of course, we cannot talk about it being written in different uh, times and not talk about the moods. So the Bible was also written in different moods, you know, highest uh, or heights of joy to the depths of despair. There were times where people were very happy when they were writing, <laughs> you know what I mean? Writing while it's somebody, there's really nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing lacking. And they are writing. They are receiving uh, 
revelation from God. But there were times where others, you know, they were not as happy as one would have thought. But they were given inspiration and they began to write. Say, so I hear you, Apostle. But since we are talking about the Old Testament here, I think it is important for me to break it down because now we have spoken to say the Bible on its own, the whole Bible has 1,189 chapters, but let's talk about the Old Testament since we are focusing on the Old Testament. So the Old Testament has 929 chapters. The Old Testament. I think I'm getting ready to close. YouTube is not here today. Uh, somebody, Mishaka found the channel and they can't stop watching. God bless you. YouTube, you are too quiet today. I don't know. More than anything, this is what we, we need to know. We'll be receiving later, but we need to know this. Oh, busy writing apostle. Okay, that makes sense. And thank God for, you know, our mentees who allowed us to come here. Uh, you see somebody say, what about deliverance meeting that you said is happening today? Didn't I explain yesterday that it will start off like this? Didn't I explain? Those who were here yesterday, they heard me. You see, somebody instead of focusing on this, they're only thinking, when is the deliverance happening? The Bible says the rushers, the just, shall be delivered by knowledge. The more you know the word of God, the more you function. Let it be part of your system. Of course, you can, no one knows 100%. You can't know it 100%. But you must know something about the word of God. You must have an idea. You must have something to talk about. You must have the foundation. Uh, Gabriella Brown saying thanks to the mentees for their patience. Hallelujah. Uh, Sydney saying thank God for the mentees. God bless them. You see, this one was here yesterday. He said, you said you were going to teach us first. Yes, Felicia, you were here yesterday. All right, so we continue. Old Testament chapters 929, so 929. We then have... 23,114 verses in the Old Testament. Words, the whole Old Testament is so big, <laughs> you won't believe this. Here, just over, over 600,000. So please just write over 600,000 words. And here's what years ago I liked more than anything when I was studying the Old Testament is that the middle book in the Old Testament is the book of Proverbs. Right. So the book of Proverbs is actually the middle book not of the entire Bible, but just the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, if you go to the book that is in the middle between Genesis and Malachi, is the book of Proverbs. How cool is that? And of course, one will think and will assume that since the middle book is Proverbs, the middle chapter is also Proverbs. No. The middle chapter is the book of Job, chapter 20. <laughs> and of course, the smallest book, most of you, you know the New Testament, but here we're talking about the Old Testament. Obviously, everybody knows the book of Obadiah. When I was 13 years, or between 13 and 14, when I first read the Bible, because I finished the whole Bible, I think I was 14 years, first time I read. It doesn't mean I understood it, but I just had to really read the Bible. 14 years. And that time we had a lot of brothers in the Lord who were saved and who loved the Lord. 
And everybody would just be reading their Bible. So one had to read their Bible. So Obadiah, being the smallest book of the Bible, was the first book I finished. Just so that when I go to school and I meet these guys back then, I told them that I finished a, chap a, 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 a book in the Old Testament. And that was Obadiah. And of course, shortest verse in the Bible is in the book of First Chronicles chapter 1, verses 25. Shortest book in the Old Testament. And there we have the, what do you call them? Uh, genealogy of uh, Adam's descendants there. And then when you get to verse 25, very short uh, names, so that makes it three names as a matter of fact, I believe, if I remember correctly. That makes it the shortest verse, unlike the New Testament, and Jesus wept. And it doesn't even have end. It just says Jesus wept in the book of John 11. That's the New Testament. And that one in the New Testament, Jesus wept, is actually the shortest verse in the entire Bible. Followed by this one that we are talking about in the Old Testament. And of course, longest verse. A lot of people think the longest verse in the Bible is in the book of Psalm. No, it's in the book of Esther. Esther chapter 8, verse 9. It has about 78 words. And longest chapter, obvious. The book of Psalm 119. Psalms 119. And it is also very important. Ah, witness of Christ was 13 years when they read the whole Bible. Wow, amazing. I, I, I was 14. Imagine. So imagine somebody, you can't you can be 25 right now in your take a take If somebody read it when they were 13, the whole Bible, you are 25, you have a better understanding. You can even read Faster. And in the days of audio Bible, you, you have not even finished your chapter. Ah, come on. Sometimes our seriousness towards the things of God have nothing, they have nothing or has nothing to do with how many services I attend per week. The Bible says he's the reward of those who diligently seek him. And there is no better way to seek him than in his word or rather through his word. Anyway, so we move. It looks like YouTube is really tired already. So I think I'll just remain with, with the mentees. I don't know, but I think YouTube, I don't know. Yeah, you say, I'm reading now 47. Let's go. Even if you're 93, let's go. Ah, you can't get to 94 or 93. And you have been a Christian for eight years. Ha! Ha ha, come on. No, 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 no. You know, only Christians don't take what they believe in serious. The other ones... Ah, from a young age, they are taught principles. They are taught this is the foundation of what. This is what we believe in. This is what makes this, this. You know? These are the ma four major interpretations of this. You know this, you know the whole thing. And as they grow up, they know that. And that will be like a map and a guideline as they read throughout whatever. You come to Christianity. People are preaching encounters. Not the Bible. It's uh, me. I saw an angel. Another one, my pastor said, we must not use anointing oil. Another one, my pastor said, we must use anointing oil. You see what I mean? And another one is talking about, don't wear pants. Another one, wear pants. <laughs> like, really. Please, before you fight me, I know Deuteronomy. Yay, I have somebody right now say, but the Bible say, please read that chapter, all of it. And let's see that you yourself, you still be standing. 
Just read all of it. Don't just read that one where it says uh, men should not wear the uh, women clothing. Just read the whole thing. You yourself, after reading it. <laughs> ah. <laughs> you close the Bible immediately. <laughs> this one says, I was born Roman Catholic. Wow. And they've been reading the Bible ever since. And guess what? They finished the Bible when they were six years. The whole Bible. Uncle Gudan. Somebody finished the whole Bible. What's the name there? Tanya. There, the name is Tanya. Not Tanya here, but another Tanya. Right. So, six years. Uncle Mabuz. Six years. MJ is five, he's turning six. My second born is five, turning six. I know. That young boy will be in trouble. From this Saturday, he'll be in trouble. We're finishing the Bible. We can't do that. It's possible. <laughs> I'm telling you. Anyway, Sina Feshaye. Yes. You see, smile, it looks good on you. <laughs> All right, so we move, right? We move. So th seven things to focus on whenever reading the Bible. Please put this down, seven things to focus on whenever, you know, reading the Bible. Well, five are the main things, but let's talk about the seven things. My mentees here, you have an idea. Number one, the author. Because understanding who the author is gives you an idea of that person's functionality. So if I know it's Moses, I know Moses was a prophet. Right? If I know it was uh, David, I understand who David was. Just an example. If it was Solomon, I understand who Solomon was. So the first thing that I need to focus on is I enter into a book. Who's the author of this book? And I've already explained to you why they are called authors. The moment you read what they've written, they have authority over you. Imagine you have never met Paul but you can literally fight somebody for what he wrote and you read and it got into your spirit. And not everything Paul wrote is the word of God, though it's in our Bibles. Paul wrote some of the things as his experience because in his books, there are moments where he does not get along with Peter. There are times where he actually calls him to order. There are times where he complains himself. There are times where he whines. Are you with that? Yes. So, but anyway, understand the author, number one. Number two, the date. Right? That will give you at least the time frame. Was this AD or was this BC? Okay, if it was BC, when? Right? Because the when gives you the why. So when you understand when, it is easier for you to understand why. Never forget that. And then after understanding the date, you then look at the audience. Who was he talking to? Who was he writing to? Right? Because once you know the audience, you then understand the reason 
which is number four. Once you know the audience, it gives you the fourth step here because there are seven things to focus on. The fourth one is the reason. When you understand the audience, because there are those who in, you know, in slavery, and something was written while is they are in slavery. So it automatically leads you to the fourth point, which is the reason he wrote. There are those who are in exile. Then it gives you the reason. There are those who are about to be delivered. Then somebody wrote, it gives you the reason. Right? The fifth thing, which is one of the most important. Every time I read the Bible, this is what I focus on, is the theme. Right? So the theme, let's, let's say example. We go to the book of Genesis. This is an example, right? Yeah, you know, Genesis is the easiest one to think about. Theme. You look at things like creation, right? You look at things like uh, the flood. You look at things like uh, the Tower of Bible. You look at things like the patriarchs. Then you talk about Abraham. You then talk about Isaac, you talk about Joseph, uh, sorry, Jacob, then you talk about Joseph. Those are the theme because it is in the book of Genesis that the main characters actually of the whole story, God's story, are introduced. And even God himself calls himself that in Exodus when he told Moses, I'm the God of Abraham, I'm the God of Isaac, and I'm the God of Jacob because it normally takes more than one generation for God to fulfill his purpose. So when you focus on the theme, you already know what to look for. I don't know if that makes sense. Praise the Lord, everybody. Because you cannot study the flood and not study the Nephilim. Because the flood did not just happen. Something provoked God. And then God said, you know what? I'm going to respond. And God made it rain. And the flood was so powerful that the water did not only come from up. Do you know that the water also came from down? Yeah, so a lot of people think the flood just rained. No, water literally came from the ground and was coming from the top. There was no way to survive that one. So once you think the flood, then you think two things. You think new beginning, you think the Nephilim. Are we together? And it is in the flood that you're going to understand that, oh, no. Hmm. Had a, grandfather, had a grandfather, and the grandfather was Enoch. But Enoch had a son. The son was Methuselah. Who was Methuselah? What does Methuselah mean? Then you realize that Methuselah, after me, the end. After you, the end. Are you hearing me? Then like, oh, so the flood was prophesied by Enoch, but he hid the prophecy in the name of his son, Methuselah. So that gives you that idea. You know what I mean? So it becomes interesting just by looking at those small things that we are talking about. Number, I'm number what now? Number six, key verses, right? Ah, example, we are there in Genesis. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. That's a very powerful thing. How does God make a man in a great nation who himself does not have a child? I don't know if that makes sense to you guys. But the more you focus on that, the more you read, the more you read, then you realize that, ah, uh ah, -uh, God started it through him. But he also fulfilled it through those who came after him. So key verses will always lead you to the answer. And of course, key words. Key words. You know, you read the Bible, you find things like bless, you find things like sin in, you know, Genesis chapter 3, and sin entered. You, throughout the Bible, you see sin being the problem, but where does this come from? The wages of sin is 
his death, he became sin. You know, all those things. He who knew no sin became sin. So it helps us. Does that make sense to you guys? Keywords, the Nephilim. What does this mean? Who are the Nephilim? Then you realize it's from the word Nafal. Nafal, what does Nafal mean? The fallen ones. Who are the fallen ones? You go to the book of Jude, it says angels who did not keep their estate. Then like they are angels who did not keep their estate. Wait a minute. Who are these angels? Then you go to Genesis 6. It then helps you to understand that, ah, these were angels. Benin Elohim, right? Came to know the daughters of men and they produced giants. Okay, 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 okay. Then that gives you a revelation that God had to wipe out this uh, type of beings because it was not something he created. And it was going to contradict with his plan. Plan of what? Redeeming men. I want us to pray. And me and my team will be praying here. And don't you go anywhere. You're not going anywhere. There's going to be deliverance in Zion today. Are you guys here though? Are you guys here? Are you guys here? Are you guys here? Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody that doing that degree in theology, but the way I explained this, I made it so easy for everyone to understand. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Joshua. God bless you. I've read the Bible three times over, but when I start listening to your teachings, I felt like napules. <laughs> Sorry for the spelling. It's okay. <laughs> oh, my goodness. With this lesson, the Bible is coming alive in my heart. Amen. I'm reading comments. I'm reading comments, so you better say something on the comment section there. Prophet, I had to wake up in the middle of the night to watch this all the way from China. All right, we should be back now. Let's pray one more time again. Like I said, don't you go anywhere. That was very prophetic. Let's, um, let's pray one more time. Let's pray for, for the spirit of understanding, spirit of revelation. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray. For the spirit of understanding, the spirit of revelation, that every word of In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Hallelujah. One thing that I would encourage you to do, so to say, after this, especially after this, is to not lean on your own understanding as you read the Bible. You see, the Bible on its own is not, like I said, a dry theological text textbook. 
but it is the vibrant story of God's redeeming work in the lives of people or his people. So you need the Holy Spirit. And I know that I'm talking to believers, I'm talking to Christians who have the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not moved and I'm not challenged. But as you read, lean not um, on your own understanding. Right? Refuse to lean on your own understanding. Allow the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in the book of 1 John chapter 2 and you read verses 27, we have received the Holy Spirit. We have received an ancient. And because of that, he teaches us. That's what the Bible says. We have received an unction. We have received the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he's the one that teaches us. And our Lord and Savior Jesus had told us that when he leaves, another helper will come. You know, of course, he was telling his disciples at that time. And then he begins to tell them that the Holy Spirit will just not just strengthen them. He will not just be an advocate, but he will be a teacher. He will be a reminder. The Bible becomes a very, you, you get to realize how interesting the Bible is. It, it, it comes alive right in front of you. We always say that the Bible is actually a living document, a living book, a book that is alive. Are you hearing me? So with the Holy Spirit, you'll understand the Bible. It will be as if you were there when it was written. That's why you, you will hear me say, I'm about to preach, I'm about to teach, like I was there when it was written. It is so amazing whenever one reads the Bible and read it with the Holy Spirit. You won't be telling the Bible what you want it to mean. Are we together? Amen. These are the days where more than anything you need the word. A lot of people can move in discernment not because they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't have the word. And one will say, but Apostle, what do you mean? I thought it would just take the Holy Spirit no. If you read the Bible in the book of Hebrews, let's see what it says. Hebrews 4. And you read verses 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And it is a what? Dicena. Of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So, but what is the Dicena? The word of God. So once the word is in you, you need no man to tell you what is what. I feel sorry for you. Because, especially if you don't have the word of God in you, I feel sorry for you. You'll never have a place where you will stay in and grow because every time you go to a place and you hear something about, you know, that particular place, you jump out. Not checking in the spirit what is happening. Most of you have written men and women of God you know, off, yet those people are very close to God and because of what you had. One thing that in my walk with God I made sure that I ran away from was information when it comes to people. But I wanted revelation from the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes people will try to bed mouth or paint anything they can't get access to. That's why I always tell some my, 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 my people and I'll say, be careful of rumors that you hear about a woman. Either they come from a man who can't get hair or a woman who can't compete with hair. So you must be careful every time you hear because even you yourself, there are people who say things about you that are not true, you. 
So if we were to move by what people say, we will not get to know you. And only a fool buys one story and concludes a matter. Of course, when it comes to your walk with God, it matters who you listen to. It matters who you follow. You can't be following somebody who's just caught up in everything, right? It doesn't make sense. I mean, whoever feeds you guys your convictions. Here you are protecting your spirit and you're protecting your soul, so to say. Your soul needs to be protected. Because once you submit under somebody, your soul is subject to their authority, in case you did not know. That's why Paul says to Philemon, you owe me your very soul. Yeah, in the book of Philemon, he says, you owe me your soul. And the Bible then says, honor them, respect them, those who watch over your soul. Why? Because once God allows you to be under somebody, they don't just father your flesh, they father that which is in you. So in protecting that, don't move by information. Move by revelation. And if you're a man of God and you're listening to me, don't run away from signs and wonders. Because a lot of men of God, they try their best not to see the word of God come to pass in a sense of God confirming his word through signs and wonders. And they run away from that. They just say, me, I'll just teach and that's it. The kingdom of God is not in words. 1 Corinthians 4.20. But it is in the demonstration of God's power. He didn't say, I, when, he said, when I came to you, I did not come to you in words. You see that now? So when John writes as well in 1 John, he says we were eyewitnesses of these things. Our eyes have seen these things. Our eyes have seen the Lord. Rubbed against these things. We did not just follow things that are there to be followed. Are you hearing me? God cannot be in a place, brothers and sisters, and the people don't see his manifestations. It is impossible. That's why when Gideon, the time the Midianites were oppressing the children of Israel, and he was hiding, and the angel said, Thou mighty man of valor, arise, for God is with you. Gideon asked the angel and said, But if God is with us, where are the miracles? that our forefathers told us about. And that is the knowledge of God he had. That God cannot be with you and you don't see his manifestations. And you don't see his power. But that does not mean every time you see power, it means God is there. But God cannot be in the place and you don't see his power. But how do you then measure? You don't measure by the appearance of the man. Or maybe how he dresses in, you know, some people like, no, I don't like him because he always dress T-shirts or anything like that. Me, I like Apostle Mies because Apostle Mies is always in a suit. No, it doesn't work like that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You then use, you see, when it comes to the word, I'm yet to see a person who can fake that. You can't. It's either it's in you or it's not there. That even when you preach it, ah, people here with ah, you, you're telling stories, you. There is nothing here. Because as you minister to others, it ministers back to you, back to you, sharper than any double-edged sword. So it hits others, it hits you. It's like a hammer. When it hammers others, it hammers you. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? So allow God to show you the direction you have to go in everything that you do. Because the days we are in, no man of God is safe. No woman of God is safe. Well, some of us, we have been fighting battles when we were 14. I remember when I started prophesying at the age of 14, I was persecuted. I was rejected. Can you believe it? I faced a lot of battles. When I was 16, it was worse. I grew up being called fake. There is no amount of fake now that even gets. It's easy. I was telling my older sister and she was laughing. It doesn't do anything. Then when I was young, <laughs> it used to affect me. I remember I'm like, God, what did I do? Why are they saying I'm fake, you know? And I would read my Bible where they said, you know, Jesus himself was using Beelzebub. 
the Lord of the flies to cast out demons. But still, I'm like, why me, God, me? You know you called me. Show these people that I'm not feeling. <laughs> and it used to bother me when I was young. But as I matured in the, into the things of God, I fought bigger battles. Every day I woke up, newspaper saying this, article saying this, this one saying this, especially when people now started experiencing the miracles of God, the blind seeing, crimple walking, deaf hearing, people, you know, who, who were not working, who are working for years, coming and coming out with a breakthrough, people who, whose husbands left 20 years ago, and I speak a word like this, and the following day they are there, and, you know, then I realized that people are not really after a title. They are after manifestations. If you do nothing, no one will, do, will say anything. But if you begin to move, and as long as you are with God, the enemy will fight you. But here's what Christians need to understand in our time. Satan does not fight his own. It's Christians who cannot identify wizards, warlocks, and witches in the church who are causing division in the body of Christ. Run away from, thank God I'm from a prophetic family. I'm in the prophetic myself. You know that. But run away from a man or a woman of God who does not have a word but every time comes and says I have a prophecy can't point you to Christ, can't preach the word of God, you're not growing spiritually, the only thing you know is just you're updated. Please run away. You are not safe. So, stick to the word. I'm excited to announce that on the 2nd of February and the 3rd of February, we are having our global online school of ministry. I'm excited to announce that. Come on, I thought you guys would be excited. I thought you guys would be excited. You can clap your hands better. You can clap your hands better. The uh, video. We lit or oh, we can use the poster. It's okay because the video might. We we'll still have to check the poster. So, uh, Brother KB will uh, put the details for the school. Oh, you already done that. Thank you, Brother KB. It says Online Global School of Ministry. There is our website there. I don't have to say a lot. Everything is right in front of you. You have to register. Remember, in the School of Ministry, we don't teach this. No, 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 no. It's a different level altogether. Right. So, but this year, we are focusing on the seasons of God. It's too deep. Deeper than what you think. We are going to talk about the move of God in this season. We are going to talk about, and when I say seasons of God, with humility, somebody maybe might have written about it or said it somewhere. We are not, it's not just a title, a sermon. No. I will promise you it's something you've never heard, and I'm saying that with humility. Right? So we are going to teach people to interpret not just the season of God, but the move of God. What does the move of God mean to you in that season, and what is expected of you? And how do you ride on the same wave? And how do you play your part? Because a lot of people have gifts but don't know what to do. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. How do you fit in? Because not everybody has, you know, that platform like a stage, pulpit, or something like that. And some, they are still growing in the things of God. One thing about a gift is a gift does not have to reach a stage of full maturity for you to start using it. As a matter of fact, the gift matures as you use it. Hence, I was talking to my mentee from USA who was here uh, this Sunday, uh, this past Sunday. You know, we're talking about something. And we got to the point where I was talking to him, uh, David Freeman. I was like, to David Freeman. So we're talking, of course, there are a few things that I was talking to him that I can't share now here. Then I was like, then when you come back, we go higher. 
right? To an extent that now I literally need to stand in front of you, look at you, and ask you, what do you see? But depending on who you are, are you hearing what I'm saying and what you're called for? You see, a lot of, I used to do that a lot, uh, some of you, because the likes of KB and Rev, you were recording. I would have people back then when we were doing, you know, in small numbers, and I will ask, what do you see? Ah, I'm telling you. <laughs> you would tell me what you saw. I'm like, no, you have not seen well. <laughs> what do you see? So I've seen, I'm, you have seen well. I remember one time a woman, very old woman, about, she was about 74 years. She was in a prophetic school. She was a seer. But she could not interpret any of the things that she could see. She, she used to see, but none of them made sense to her. And one time, I asked her, what do you see? She spoke about she saw avocado. She, oh, she saw a lot of things. She went as far as seeing milk. And I stood there. I said, Lord, why is this woman seeing weird things like this? Then the Lord opened my eyes and said, everything she sees is an interpretation already. It doesn't need any interpretation. I don't know if you guys understand. I've already showed her something in a dream. But what she sees in an open vision is an interpretation. Then I asked her, what did you see in your dream? She then remembered. When we put it together, it was an interpretation. The only problem I remember that she did, she opened the church. She left a man of God. She was from Zimbabwe. She left a man of God. She opened the church. And the Lord had told me to tell her, don't open a church. Because the moment she got interpretation, she used to then go to people, tell people something, and it would happen exactly. So a lot of people now started going to her to even ask about their future. And I told her, I said, that's not the direction. Now because the gift has been unlocked, that's not the direction. I don't know what happened. You know, sometimes we, how it is, you think maybe now because I'm here, this person is jealous or something. Then something happened. She opened the church. I don't know what happened. It was as if something was taken out and that thing closed. Why? Because you need to understand something. Just because you have a gift doesn't mean you open a church. Just because you have a revelation, you have a burning sermon, <laughs> uh, sermons don't uh, you know push people to open churches it's a calling hallelujah so this school is a special one that is day one day two now we are talking about oh no that one no let me leave it to those uh, for those who, who will be there it will be a very powerful one so register if you have not registered and if you are here and you are under the influence of my voice and you are unable to register, make sure that you follow the teachings that we have done. We have so many teachings here, special prophetic teachings that we have uploaded on YouTube for you to access them. And we are doing our best. But if you are there and you want to take your spiritual life to another level, especially your calling, so to say, register. If you, it, you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a woman of God in a sense of preacher for you to be part of it. You just have to have a burning desire for Jesus and the work of God. And this will help you to become an effective soul winner. Because not only would you be talking, but you will also be moving in the gift that God has put in you. Say, I hear you, Apostle. I hear you, Apostle. So I encourage all of you guys to go to that website right now. Well, we have a lot of people that are registering because I know that next week things might change. So you don't want to come in and then it's full. Right. So go ahead and register. Of course, you still have time, but I advise you to do it today as early as possible. Hallelujah. Most of our mentees here, of course, already, if not all of you, have registered so many. I don't know how some of you, like Peggy and others, I don't know how you registered, guys, because you guys registered before we even announced it. So the team set up the website today, the same day we had people registering. And I'm like, who's giving these people information? Because this thing is going to be full before we even announce it. Then 
Nobody knew. And I'm like, are they prophesying or something? But anyway, mentees, thank you so much for loving God and for being on fire for Jesus. Let us go there and register. Those that have not registered, uh, it helps us in so many ways. And lives are being blessed. And transformed, of course. Have you guys been blessed today? Amen. I'm not seeing your hands. You look, you, look, you look unhappy. I don't know why. This is the moment where you go like apostle. We are very happy. Because I'm very happy for you guys. There's still a lot to learn. Blind eyes open. Hallelujah. Can't we do another two hours, please, Apostle? Ah, I don't want to lie. This is where I'm stopping. I want to, to be honest with you. Timmy, I want to. Is that Timmy? I want to, right? But two hours, hey. <laughs> That's why you should be in the school, because in the school we go deeper and we go longer. Hallelujah. We go deeper. We go what? Even longer. If you know you are chosen by God, you know you have a calling, you know you have a gift, don't make a mistake of not registering, especially now because this is our first ever school of ministry in the year 2024, and it's right February. It will set you up for the year 2024, the year of greatness. So make sure that you register so that even as you go up, you have direction. Hallelujah. Wave your hands in the Holy Ghost. There we go. I'm seeing a lot of people that are waving their hands. So the reason why I keep looking down is because today I'm seeing my people here. <laughs> and YouTube is here as well. Lee Thomas is blessed. Michael Porsche is blessed. Enid Struzik. Very blessed. I know any any loves the weight, so I know she loves the weight. So Mary Sailor, all the way from Australia, blessed. Charity, all the way from UK, blessed. Monica De La Cruz, all the way from USA, blessed. Lynette, all the way from USA, blessed. Uh, Mohon, all the way from uh, USA. Who, who, I'm looking for South Africa now, guys. I can't be calling USA every time. Take me to South Africa, please. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Ah, uh, this is all USA here. Wait. Oh, Michael Porsche, South Africa. We have India, uh, Casey. We have Australia. Okay, now we are cooking. We also have Ntati, South Africa. Oh, now we are talking. We have Vusiona, South Africa. Ah, now, now we have Dakesha. Hey, Dakesha, I know Dakesha, she's in Trinidad or somewhere in the in some Caribbean island. Very powerful woman of God, by the way. Very anointed woman of God. Very powerful. Anyway, we have Erica. Uh, I think Erica, she's in... Uh, hmm. Erica, can you believe I forgot? Ivory Coast. Am I correct? Am I correct? Somewhere there, right? No, Susan. Oh, Susan. Yeah, Susan, she's in... Ivory. Not... Yeah, not that Susan, the other one. Yeah, Susan is in Ivory Coast. Yes. Okay. Botswana, Texas is here. Nigeria. Oh, Nigeria. I love Nigeria. I love Nigeria. Oh, I love Nigeria. USA, South Africa. Is that Bahamas? Why do we only have USA and... Jamaica competing in the house. South Africa. Nigu Upina. Oh, there is South Africa. Okay. That's more like it. Guys, we can't be having uh, Tanzania. There we go. Atlanta. Australia. Georgia is here. Mzansi is also here. Yeah. Swaziland, Zambia, now we are cooking. Now we see it's balanced now. Oh my goodness. 
Lord, have mercy. And remember, we were supposed to, last year, we were supposed to be, oh, even Canada is here. That's more like it. We are now cooking now, cooking with gas. New York, too much snow. Ah, that's why you should come for the retreat. There is so much sun here. It's cool. It's nice. You should be in South Africa. Albania, amazing. Well, Kenya, wow, amazing. I love you all with the love of God. Stay in God. See you Sunday. We are having, uh, what do you call the service again? Family blessing, anointing service, exactly. This coming Sunday in Randbeck, Johannesburg. Service that's at 10. Come early for space. Hallelujah. And God bless. God bless everybody. I love you. Go register.